I am really honored and it's really a great pleasure for me, first of all, to take part once again in an event hosted by the Aspen Institute because each of our meetings, each of uh, your initiatives provides us with so much food for thought and I'm sure this is also the case uh, in this uh, couple of days here. It is also always a great pleasure to join my friends on the German a decade since I became uh, a fellow of the fund and uh, uh, the people I met back then are still uh, playing a very important uh, part of uh, the relations I've developed in these years, uh, including in my current job. So thank you for providing me a good and solid basis uh, for uh, these challenging uh, times and tasks. So let, my, let me begin by quoting an op-ed uh, that you wrote together with Marta over the summer. Uh, you talked about the global strategy and uh, you said it must be, I quote, uh, the springboard for an exercise in political information. I really think that uh, uh, this is exactly what we have to do. Uh, this is exactly the meaning of the global strategy, the reason why we have developed it and presented it. This strategy cannot stay on paper. It's not a document. And in fact, our exercise in political innovation, as you put it, has already started in these weeks. Often we complain that European Union uh, is low. Uh, well, we might be in a position that uh, uh, member states complain we're running too fast. But that's good. I think that's good. If you think about it, um, you look back, the Lisbon Treaty financial crisis. The difficult times for Europe and for our citizens. And everyone was so busy with addressing that emergency and it feels like we forgot to explore the full potential of the treaty and of an enlarged European Union. Since then, Europe has often given the impression of jumping from one emergency, from one crisis to the other. I believe that we have now realized that crisis management is not enough. We have faced the financial crisis, security threats, but it's not only that we have to look at. We need to explore all our instruments that are already there. We need to make full use of them to realize how powerful our union is. I often say you can be the strongest actor in the world, but if you don't realize your strength, if you're not aware of your power, you don't use it. It's useless. So we need to understand what works in the European Union, what doesn't work, what uh, can work better and change where we need to change and use what we have. When we started working on the global strategy, we knew very well that it couldn't be simply made in Brussels. This is a strategy for the whole union, for each of our citizens. Actually, this brings us to a reflection of what it is, the European Union. I often say, you know, the only ones that cannot afford the luxury of antagonizing their capital city and the European Union is Belgium. But apart from that, we all have to realize that the European Union is each and every of us, and we have a common shared responsibility to make it work. The Europeans, there is no European Union without each and every of the capital cities of our member states. There is no European Union, finally, without each and every citizen of the Union. So this strategy was born to make the common ground, the common interest of European citizens emerge in the field of foreign and security policy. So not something produced in closed rooms, in buildings far away, from our lives. It had to reflect all our different traditions, geographies, histories, priorities. Lazar for the Romanian contribution to drafting of the text that was very much appreciated as it was the contribution that Aspen uh, provided to us. 
and I'm not saying this just to be nice to my host. Uh, people know that I'm can be very blunt uh, and direct, I'm not very diplomatic. It was really appreciated. It was really bringing a special contribution to our exercise, and it has to continue. Because the strength of our union is our diversity, the richness of our national diplomacies, the plurality of our points of view. Often I'm asked to guarantee that the European Union speaks with one voice, and I always say our strength is not plurality of our voices. The important thing is that we pass the same message, we work in the same direction, we sing the same song, but with different voices. Our strength is that we are a choir rather than uh, a single singer. For instance, from this side of Europe, from this side of the Union, it is much more evident that we cannot split our foreign policy in two. Those that are looking to the east and those that are looking to the south. You look at the Black Sea region, and it couldn't be more evident than that, that you have to look south and east at the same time. Europe can be a global power, a strong to do the two things at the same time, east and south. Uh, I was sharing with Mircea and other friends uh, just a few minutes ago, I spent uh, almost one year in 2014 as an Italian minister saying that uh, the European Union uh, could have not afforded focusing only on the Eastern crisis and that we should have kept the developments on the South on the agenda. Now I spend my time saying uh, the rest of the story, that we should not forget the East because of the worsening of the situation in the South or in the Middle East. There's no contradiction in that. We have the strength, we have the responsibility, we have the duty, we have the hindrance at the same time. And this would give us the credibility and the strength also to be a strong global player. And we have the potential to do so. And first of all, we cannot afford shying away from using such potential. But this isn't simply about geography. Look at any country in our Eastern partnership, and you will see that our relations are incredibly complex and rich. Our cooperation spans from energy to human rights, from migration to connectivity, and each of our member states has its own network, its historic and geographic ties. At the same time, we can be so much stronger as a union of half the greatest economy in the world and the greatest market in the world and the biggest humanitarian donor and the biggest development actor and a strong and responsible security provider, always, always working for peace. So, Lazar, you were asking for a little bit, and you also, a little bit of positive injections. I take it as my personal uh, job description, because I see how our partners see us from outside. I think I have responsibility importance that all our partners around the world attach to the European Union and bring it back to our citizens and to our decision makers inside the Union. This is why we need a global strategy. And now we have it. We must make sure that it leads to concrete changes in the way we do our foreign policy. Our work on implementation has already started, as I said, over the summer. So let me briefly focus on some of the main strengths we're focusing on currently, together with the foreign ministers, the defense ministers, the heads of state and government, the development cooperation ministers, and with all my colleagues and friends in the European Commission. But most of all, let me... We have produced the strategy together with an open process, together with the civil society, think tanks, academia, the foreign and security policy community, in Europe and beyond, because we received a lot of contributions from very far away, from Brazil to Japan. And we, we need to keep that open space also for our implementation work. So the first area of our work on implementation concerns resilience and an integrated approach to conflicts and crises. We understand this better than anyone else here in Europe. Just think of the European history, or just think of Ukraine. Of course, the from a security point of view and through diplomacy 
<coughs> working for the implementation of the MISC agreements, as we are doing every single day. But the stabilization of Ukraine requires much more than that. It requires also greater resilience for the country's institutions. It requires good reforms to help the Ukrainian economy thrive. And the same goes for the protracted conflicts in the wider Black Sea region. The media keep forgetting about them now until the next escalation, which means hopefully never, but. The point is that our foreign policy needs to keep a constant, constant causes of the conflicts with all tools at our disposals, without following necessarily the headlines in the news, but keeping the focus from an early stage to after the acute moments of crisis are gone. The second area of implementation of the strategy concerns the link between internal and external policies, starting with two priorities that every European citizen feels. Security and human mobility, counterterrorism and migration. These are two fields where it's self-evident to everybody in Europe that our internal only if rooted with coherent and with coherent and effective external policies and vice versa. Our external policies have a sound basis only if only if our internal policies are credible, sustainable and coherent with our values. So the third, last element of implementation for our strategy for the moment, uh, last but definitely not least of it, is security and defence. The security of our citizens has never been so closely connected to our foreign policy. Every our borders is impacting our citizens' daily lives. At the same time, our partners are asking for a stronger Europe of defence. Just two weeks after I presented the global strategy at the end uh, of June, John Kerry joined a meeting of our European Foreign Affairs Council. Laza will remember that. And I was surprised to find out that it was the first time ever for a US Secretary of State to join our European Union Foreign Affairs Council. Isn't that incredible? Still, we did it. And we did it a few weeks after the referendum in the UK. I think it's not by chance. Decision to strengthen our union, including in the field of defense. And I think John visited Brussels uh, four or five times in the last couple of months. A strong sign of friendship and partnership. I'll come back to that at the end. But the very same day I presented the global strategy to the European Council at the end of June, the first person I handed to the uh, copy of the strategy personally was my friend Jens Stoltenberg, uh, 10 minutes after presenting the strategy to the Council. The Secretary General of NATO, for those of you that might not know it, I don't think there are many in the room. <laughs> but also very concrete commitment to our cooperation. In fact, Jens joined our informal meeting of defense ministers just one week ago, 10 days ago, in Bratislava, as he always does, he always comes to our defense ministerial meetings, as I always go to the NATO defense ministerial meetings. And his message there, 10 days ago, was crystal clear, in public and in the meeting, a strong European defense cooperation can only reinforce NATO. There is no contradiction. On the contrary, there is only space for complementarity. And it is not by chance it implementing forward in parallel, in parallel, at the same time, hand in hand, to the implementation of the EU NATO Warsaw Joint Declaration. We can strengthen each other because NATO needs a strong Europe of defense. We are now discussing concrete proposals to bring the Europe of Defence to the next level and we have committed to a very tight timetable. Next month I will present ministers with a full implementation plan on defence and security to which all member states are currently in these days contributing. And the idea is to bring it to the European Council in December. We can 
on more effective cooperation on capabilities and on the full use of the potential the treaties give us in the field of security and defence. As I said, the Lisbon Treaty contains a number of provisions that have never been really used or explored, and maybe it's time we start using the tools we have. So I see a strong political will to move forward in this field. It's what our citizens expect. It's what I expect our national leaders will be ready to do. And I believe this is a truly historic opportunity. We can fulfill the process that started in Lisbon. We can realize the dream of Europe's founding fathers and mothers. A few of them, but still some. We always imagined that a defense community would have gone hand in hand with the economic community. Back in the 50s. The world has changed, Europe has changed, but the potential for that is still there. And maybe the time is right to go for that. But most of all, we can truly address our citizens' needs and our partners' aspirations and expectations. Because our partners around the world have very clear ideas on us, on the EU and on the strength of the EU. So let me conclude. Three days ago, in Brussels, at the GMF event, delivered a very powerful speech on transatlantic relations. And he said, I quote, I encourage you all, and the you is us Europeans, I encourage you all to believe in yourselves as much as we believe in you. I believe we have a common responsibility to listen to him. Thank you very much.